And welcome to this week's Exploring John's Gospel. This week we look at the crucifixion of Jesus. In fact, the last trial, so the trial in front of, of, uh, of Pilate, and then, of course, the crucifixion itself. Um, so effectively, the first 27 verses of chapter 19. Let's listen to it together. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I can find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed, you, handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they replied, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with, two, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing near her, nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. These 27 verses show us the, the story of the, of the trial in front of Pilate 
And then, of course, also the crucifixion itself. Uh, we're going to complete the story of the crucifixion uh, next week. But as we look at this passage, what I'd like us to do is to just, just read through it, think about it again, and then share and discuss what your first impressions are of the story. Welcome back. Before we dive into the content of this particular passage, I'd like us to think about just the differences between the way John tells the story and the way the synoptics do. In fact, it's hard even to say the synoptics because each of the synoptic gospels write the story differently. They all have different accounts. They all have different ways of, of approaching it, different focuses that they're looking at. But the interesting thing with John's gospel is that in John's gospel, the one thing that stands out more than any other is this concept of kingship, this concept that Jesus is a king. Notice how many times that's alluded to within the passage, from the crown of thorns to actually being called the king, to Pilate actually acknowledging him as the king, to the people themselves rejecting him as the king and acknowledging Caesar instead as their only king. In each of those, you can see that, that John's gospel has got a very strong sense that Jesus is in control. And he doesn't want to deflect any relationship with anybody else or connected with that. Notice that there's no, there's no interaction with the, the thieves on either side. In fact, there's, they're not even called thieves. It's just two other people who are, are crucified with Jesus. So that Jesus is in the center. Jesus is in absolute control over the whole process all the way through, including the trial itself. For John, that's very important, is that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, it's interesting, again, that here, one of the reasons, or at least the reason that the crowd or the Jews or Jewish authority give to kill Jesus is because he called himself the Son of God. Now, you might remember that this is a theme that's been running through the whole of John's gospel, particularly, whereas the synoptic gospels will focus on Jesus being the Son of Man, being like us. John has said right from the beginning in John chapter 1 that he was in the beginning. He was with God. He is the Son of God. And as such, that's a very different perspective that you see from John's gospel. Jesus isn't going into, the, uh, it, into this concept of, of, of the crucifixion kind of as a lamb to the slaughter. Jesus isn't going into this as somebody who, who's, who's, who's worried or concerned or upset, as we saw in the, 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 the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane in the, books, in the, in the synoptics. That prayer is not in the book of John or John's gospel. For John, Jesus is, is facing this reality of becoming, of, of becoming God's sacrifice, of, becoming, of doing God's work, of actually doing his work. And we'll see some of that in the next section uh, next week when we actually see his words from the cross, which are very much connected to his mission that he's been sent on. But I think that that's the first thing that we need to hold on to is this, this concept very much of Jesus facing his mission with, with resolute connection, with resolute understanding of what he's doing. He's facing what God has sent him to do, and he's going to complete that particular task. What I'd love to, to you to do is to think about what does that mean for us? What does it mean for us that Jesus faces the, 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 the coming, these impending uh, uh, crucifixion, not with, with fear or trepidation, not with concern or, or wonder, but in fact that he is in control, that God is in control even in this place where in fact the world seems to be in control. Maybe discuss that. Welcome back. We're going to be looking at the, the symbols uh, and uh, some of the, the, the concepts that are in with those symbols. And the first one is two words that are in Hebrew or Aramaic, depending on, on exactly how you, you see the language and the progress of the language. But it's the two words for the one is called Gabatha, which is, of course, the place where where Jesus is, is, is on trial in front of Pilate. And then the other is Golgotha, 
which is the place of the skull. Both of them are symbols. Uh, the first one, and notice that, that John introduces both of them with the words, in the Aramaic it is. Now, it's interesting that particularly with Gabatha, is that Gabatha is actually not a translation of the Greek word, uh, which is actually just before that, which is the, the stone pavement or the lithostratos, uh, the, the stone pavement that's there. Um, it, in fact, the word Gabatha actually means an elevated space. So it's almost in a sense that this was a known place. This was a known location within Jerusalem. And I think for me, that's where the symbols of both of these words, Gabatha and Golgotha, actually make a connection. Not so much in terms of what they symbolize, although that's still there, but the fact that they locate the crucifixion very carefully is that there's a sense in which the Gabbatha was the stone pavement was, was kind of almost the place where Pilate would make his pronouncements from. Uh, it would be the place of Pilate's power. Um, and so he makes, he makes a, a statement of power there. Golgotha being the place of the skull, again, we're not sure what that means. Does it mean that there was a place where people were often um, put to death? Uh, were there, uh, was it a place where, yeah, and so therefore the skull was kind of connected to, to death? Was it a place that actually looked like a skull? Was there a, a, a hill that actually had uh, maybe, you know, kind of a framework that looked like a skull? Either way, the reality of it is, is that when we look at those two places, they place them in terms of their location. And they are a location of earthly power. And I think that's, for me, the symbol that's here, is that what, what John's doing is, is, is actually placing this concept in a, in, in a location of earthly power, both in Pilate and then in the crucifixion itself. But Jesus is actually going to overcome that earthly power with a heavenly power, with God's power. That God's power will overrule both Pilate's pronouncement and will overrule death that comes out of the, uh, the, the place of the skull, out of Golgotha. And I think it's that image of, of power, of which power will will actually succeed, which power will actually achieve what it's, what it's seeking to achieve, is I think the image of both of those names and why John goes out of his way to tell us what the Hebrew name would be, not just what the translation of the Greek name is, but also somehow kind of giving us a location of earthly power, which is going to come into conflict and it's going to come into direct uh, conflict and connection with, with heavenly power. The second thing that comes in the symbols process is the one that's right at the end, which is Jesus' first word from the cross, or first words from the cross, really. When he looks down from the cross and he sees his mother there, and he also sees the disciple. Now, we're not told which disciple that is, but I think just the way in which it's written, it seems to imply that it would be John himself. And he looks at his mother and he says, Mother, or woman in this case, uh, and notice that when he says woman, he's not using that in a pejorative sense, but rather just in, in, in a sense of a title, um, that she is the woman, here is, here is you, your, your son, and then son, here is your, your mother. And then such a wonderful word after that, it says the disciple took her into his home from that point onwards. Now, we need to work out how do we understand that passage or that symbol that's coming in there, because I think that this is more symbolic than, than reality. It, I don't think that necessarily John took Mary into his home and uh, for that point onwards. Um, if, we, in fact, we look at the other Gospels, we realize that Mary, of course, had other sons. Uh, in fact, even in terms of the writing of the New Testament, we believe that two of the books of the New Testament, both Jude and James, were actually written by brothers of Jesus. So if that's the case, then Mary had at least somebody to look after her already. In a sense, though, what I think this is almost wanting to, to, to do is to give us a symbol of church, of the church, where here uh, the woman is, is, is a... a kind of a symbol of, of the church that, that needs to be, be looked after, needs to be connected to. And John becomes a symbol of Jesus' own continuing 
presence and relationship with the church, that in fact, that the church will be looked after, that the church will be cared for, that the church will be nurtured in the time ahead. I think that in some ways there's there's that symbolic reality of saying that even though this seems like the end, that Christ is on the cross, that it seems as if all is lost, that in fact Christ will look after the church. And in many ways in the history of the church, that's been the case ever since. Is that even in the times when we've lamented and thought that the, the church is over, that, that things are done, that this is the end, that in fact Christ looks down upon us from the cross and says, well, in fact, from heaven in terms of the church, and says, I will continue to look after you. I will continue to acknowledge you. And it takes us back to what we saw in earlier chapters, particularly during the, the high priestly prayer, during the time in, in, the, in the upper room, when in fact Jesus prays that the Holy Spirit would come and be with his disciples and would keep them. It's almost in a sense that that image between his mother and the disciple actually is the same relationship that between the church and the Holy Spirit who would actually keep them and connect them together. I'd like you to discuss those two symbols and what they mean for you. Uh, the symbols of, of, of Golgotha and Gabbatha. And then, of course, the symbol of that mother and son and the relationship that those two would have together. Welcome back. We're going to dive a little deeper into two images or two concepts that come into this process. And, and I think they're two interesting ones from the, the way in which John writes the story. Um, the first one is the sign above Jesus' head on the cross. Now, you may be aware that, in fact, when um, people were crucified in the Roman era, what they would do is they would write their crime up on that piece of paper or the, on that parchment or whatever it was, and they would then nail it to the cross above their head so that anybody walking past would immediately be able to know that they what their crime was. Maybe they were a runaway slave or they had stolen something or they, they had killed somebody, that murderer or whatever would then be written above their head. The interesting thing is that what's written above Jesus' head is not his crime, at least not as far as Caesar was concerned. The crime that he had was to call himself the son of God. Yet what Caesar writes above his head is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. And it's interesting with that, that, that what he writes there, in fact, is not so much his crime, but his claim. The other interesting thing is that it's only in John's gospel that we hear that that sign written above his head is written in three languages. It's written in Aramaic, it's written in Latin, and it's written in Greek, which essentially meant that everybody in the Roman world would have been able to read it. In fact, what you can imagine that it is, it's, it's really that it's, it's almost Pilate's acknowledgement and of belief in Jesus. That as much as he's allowed him to be crucified, what he's actually saying is, I think that he is the king of the Jews. I think that he is that position. And in fact, when he gets confronted by it, that's what he says as well. And we'll talk about that later on in the session. I think that when we look at that story of, of what he's written above there, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. As I said earlier, that concept of kingship really comes out in this passage, that he is the king. And as you would have seen in the passage, Caesar wanted him to be, to be let free. Caesar actually thought of him as, as maybe the king. He might be the king of the Jews. He might actually have that position. If we look at that sign, not as Jesus' crime, but as Jesus' claim, what does that claim mean for us? The second image or the second concept there is the casting of lots. Now, you'll notice that one of the things that Jesus doesn't say from the cross is Eli, Eli, Lema, Sabachthani, or my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, of course, that line comes from Psalm 22. But interestingly, what we do see is a quote from Psalm 22. Um, and this time, it's not about the forsakenness, 
but the the sharing or the the, the 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 dividing up of his clothing and so they divide up his clothing but then his undergarment the undergarment is one woven uh, fabric and so therefore they instead of of tearing it apart they decide that they would cast lots for it and that brings to mind the fulfillment of the scripture in psalm 22 now i find that really interesting because it's almost in the sense that that john didn't want to use uh, Psalm 22 verses 1, but he uses another one to, to again bring that sense of, of, of you know, uh, how horrible it was in terms of the cross, that in fact they would actually be, be, be casting lots for his clothing. But then comes this single undergarment and the single unity of this undergarment. Now, it's interesting, the early church, the, the church fathers believe that that undergarment symbolized the community of Christ. That the community of Christ was symbolized by that undergarment, which, which, held, which was held together, which had a unity within Christ. And that even at his death, the church wouldn't be split apart, wouldn't be torn apart, but would continue to be together as one community in Christ. In some ways, some might think that that's a bit of a fanciful kind of an image or, or, or interpretation of that, uh, that concept. But for me, when I look at that passage, that it's more about the fulfillment of Psalm 22. It's more about saying that even though when everything is wrong, when everything goes wrong, when everything seems to be going wrong, that we can actually know that Christ is still with us. That in fact, there was a sense of acknowledgement that this was going to happen, that there would be trials, that there would be troubles, but in fact, we would be able to deal with them and overcome them. I'd like you to think about those two images as we go deeper. What does it mean for Christ to be our king? And what does it mean for us that, in fact, we may be held in unity with him even when things are at their worst? Welcome back. We're going to finish the session by looking at just an application for this. And, and it's an application of the story for us in terms of, of Pilate's words. When Pilate had written the, the uh, caption above Jesus' head, the, the, uh, the Jewish authorities come to him and say, he's not the king of the Jews. He claimed to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate responds by saying, what is written is written. What I have written, I have written. And it's interesting, it's in a different um, tense in the Greek. In the Greek, it's, it's in a tense called the pluperfect. And what it means is, is that what I've done, I've done and it's done for all time. Uh, it, it applies for always. And it's almost a confession of faith in it for, for Pilate. Uh, it's almost as if in that sense, Pilate becomes a, a type or a symbol of those who would actually acknowledge Jesus as the king, who would come to realize that maybe through interaction with him, through understanding him, through realizing who he was, that he would say, okay, I believe that Jesus is actually the king. And I want us to finish this session by, by acknowledging those words for ourselves and saying, what I have written, I've written. And asking ourselves for us, saying that if we are to write down who Christ is for us, if Christ, we have to write down that Christ is the king of all things for us, what does that mean for us? What does that mean in terms of our daily life? What does that mean in terms of what we're going to do tomorrow? What are we going to do this week? What are we going to do this year? How does it change the way I live to acknowledge that Jesus is the king and it is written and it is written for all time. Let's discuss that.